Thank you, Dr. Sharp. I always like to come behind a worship leader who's excited about what he's doing. Appreciate that, Dr. Sharp. You're the sharpest guy I've ever followed. Thank you, students, for being here, faculty for being here. Anybody else who might be here that doesn't fit in that category, there is one here. Today does not fit that category, and that's my wife Vicky. And though she never likes for me to acknowledge her, uh, I still want to do it anyway. Vicky, would you stand? Uh, she's being chaperoned by Dr. Bozeman back there in the back, and thank you for being here. She's been my marriage partner and ministry partner for 36 years, and I just that's saying something in this day and time, and I appreciate her for being here. Appreciate you for being here, Dr. Newsom. Thank you for the invitation to. To preach in chapel and and uh, thanks to Dr. Kelly for always allowing us the privilege to speak. I want to share with you today around the topic of the integrity of doctrinal integrity. Maybe a little play on words, maybe not. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a passage of scripture out of the gospel according to Mark chapter 7. Uh, this is an event, an encounter Jesus had with the Pharisees. Some might say his dreaded enemies. One of many encounters that Jesus experienced with the Pharisees and the scribes. I'll be reading out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the or the Hardcore Southern Baptist Translation, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so, I, because you may have different translations or scriptures, I've, I've had the uh, scripture embedded in the PowerPoint, so it'll come there and you can follow along there or in your copy of God's Word, Mark chapter 7. And we will begin our reading in verse number 1. The Pharisees and some of the scribes, who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they observed that some of his disciples were eating their bread with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, in fact, all the Jews, will not eat unless they wash their hands ritually, keeping the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they have washed. And there are many other customs they have received and keep, like the washing of cups, jugs, copper utensils, and dining couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, that is, they ask Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating bread with ritually unclean hands? He answered them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commands of men. Disregarding the command of God, you keep the tradition of men. He also said to them, you completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say... If a man tells his father or mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me is Corban, that is, a gift already committed to the temple. You no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. You revoke God's word by your tradition that you have handed down. May God bless the reading of His Word. The New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary has affirmed five core values of which in doctrinal integrity is core value number one. And you're going to see that on the screen in a moment. 
I've copied this right out of the catalog. It's also embedded on the seminary website. Core value number one, doctrinal integrity. Now you know what a core value is. It's, it's that which we value. It's the pillars, the foundation upon which the organization is built, upon which the organization exists. And core value number one states this about doctrinal integrity. Again, it's right there before you. Knowing that the Bible is the Word of God, we believe it, teach it, proclaim it, and submit to it. Our confessional commitments are outlined in the Articles of Religious Belief and the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. A little word study here, uh, of course, may help, but you're familiar with the words doctrinal and integrity. Doctrinal meaning of or pertaining to or concerned with doctrine, and thus doctrine is the basic body of Christian teaching. Integrity is the quality of being honest and adhering to strong moral principles, or integrity is the state of being undivided. So then, what distinguishes New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary from other non-Southern Baptist seminaries is our doctrinal position. NOBTS has affirmed that the Bible is the Word of God. Thus we believe it, teach it, proclaim it, and submit to it. The Bible is the starting place, not the ending place. It's where we start to develop our doctrine. It's not that we develop our doctrine, our theology, and then we go back to see if, if it's okay with the Bible. We start with the Bible. And our doctrine theology flows out of the Scripture, and thus... God's Word is the standard. It is the foundation for our confessional commitments as outlined in these articles of religious belief and the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. The seminary catalog also confirms that, and I, this is a quote right out of the catalog, all the faculty members of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary subscribe to the articles of religious belief and the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Every one of us employed by NOBTS must indicate our doctrinal integrity and our confessional commitments to these confessions of faith. We, we must live that way, teach that way. If we don't, we'll get in trouble. And I can assure you it's the same way when you accept a vocational ministry position, either in a local church or a missionary agency like IMB or NAM, or an SBC entity like Lifeway or a state convention, I assure you it's the same way that you must affirm and adhere with strong moral principle and honesty to the doctrinal foundation of that church, that agency or institution. And in most instances of Southern Baptist life, it will be the Baptist faith and message or some similar statement of faith. So that if you violate and invalidate any doctrinal belief, your employment can be terminated. To say it another way, as Southern Baptists, we do and we should take doctrinal integrity seriously. However, I want to challenge us this morning hopefully also encourage us as well as challenge us, regarding our own integrity with doctrinal integrity. I'm concerned with a rising dishonesty and dividing spirit within our churches, our denomination, and even in our seminary community. I'm fearful that in our discussions, debates, and deliberations, we're guilty of the two H words. You know what the two H words are? Hypocrisy and heresy. I can assure you that there are two words you never want to be called, accused of, or associated with. You don't ever want to be called or accused or associated with hypocrite and heretic. And so my challenge this morning is to 
Do simply this. My challenge is to us in this way. If we do not maintain integrity with our doctrinal integrity, then we're in danger of both hypocrisy and heresy. I'd like to just discuss those for a moment. What does that look like? Well, let's consider first the danger of hypocrisy. In our scriptural text, Mark detailed an ongoing dispute between Jesus, the Pharisees, and some of the scribes. And you know from your study of Scripture, it was an ongoing debate. It was an ongoing conflict. In this instance, in Mark 7, they observed, that is the scribes and Pharisees observed, that some of Jesus' disciples were eating with unclean, or as Mark interprets for us, unwashed hands. These washings were not an issue of personal hygiene, nor were they commanded by the Levitical law. They were inclusive of the traditions of the Pharisees that they had mandated upon the people. And Jesus makes that very clear. He used the word tradition several times in here. Their traditions, your traditions, he says. According to Matthew 23, verse 4, these traditions had become a heavy burden to those who were practicing Judaism. Now, in verses 3 and 4 of our text, Mark offered a parenthetical interpretation. Look at that very carefully. He said, for the Pharisees, in fact, all the Jews will not eat unless they wash their hands ritually, keeping the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they have washed. And there are many other customs they've received and keep, like the washing of cups, jugs, copper utensils, and dining couches. The Pharisees and scribes then asked Jesus a question. They said, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders? Now pay careful attention to Jesus' response here. Here's Jesus' response. Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites, the H word. As it is written, that is from Isaiah, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commands of men, disregarding the command of God. You keep the tradition of men. You completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. Ladies and gentlemen, that's some strong words. Maybe some of the strongest words Jesus ever spoke. By elevating their traditions to a level of equality to God's Word, the Pharisees eroded their own moral character and violated the very integrity of of God's Word. Therefore, Jesus branded them with the dreaded H word. You hypocrites! The word literally means play actor or pretender. Now that's not the only time the word is ever used in the New Testament. Twice in His Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Jesus criticized hypocrites. For one, He criticized them for being pious in public interested more in the human applause than God's affirmation. And two, he criticized them for being judgmental of the faults of others and ignoring their own faults. As in this instance, Jesus often called the Pharisees hypocrites because of their dishonesty between their outward actions and their inner attitudes. And when you journey through the New Testament, you'll find hypocrisy is a major issue in the New Testament. Hypocrisy characterized the sin of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. In Galatians 2, Paul accused Peter of hypocrisy for refusing to eat with Gentile Christians in Antioch. Paul warned Timothy about hypocritical false teachers in 1 Timothy 4. Peter included hypocrisy as one of the attitudes Christians should avoid in 1 Peter 2. Six times in the New Testament, 
Christians are challenged to live a life of sincerity, which literally means without hypocrisy. So then to be a hypocrite is to be insincere. To be sincere is to be without hypocrisy. Now here's the question for us today. You can never take God's Word without making implication and application to us today. Are we any different when we elevate any tradition or any preference to the level of doctrine? In fact, notice quickly and carefully that the context of Jesus' warning against hypocrisy right out of the prophet Isaiah is in the context of worship. So therefore, I don't need to make this up. Jesus talked about that 2,000 years ago. You think maybe He could look in advance and see 2,000 years we'd still be having a struggle with that? I don't need to tell you that the greatest and most frequent conflicts in churches today are conflicts over worship tradition and worship preference. Dr. Newsom mentioned that I have leadership over the professional doctoral programs and these are the doctor of ministry, doctor of educational ministry degrees. We have about a hundred different seminars and workshops that our students can take uh, depending on what their specialization is and so forth. And out of all of those, there is only one that has to be offered every year there's only one that as it's offered every year that always maxes out in enrollment every time we do it and has a waiting list. The, the, the only one that's by far the most requested, the most uh, embraced seminar is the one managing church conflict. One of the assignments that I have them do in that seminar is to present some case studies some case studies of congregational conflict that we can work on and unpack and maybe help to resolve in the seminar. Would you like to guess that at least half of the case studies that always come back, that the students always give, most of them aren't made up, most of them are real live case studies, are case studies that deal with some aspect of worship tradition or worship preference. That's just where we're living you know that. And by the way, it's not a new issue, new conflict. It's been going on a long time. It was going on in the little church I grew up in when, when we changed from the old Green Broadman hymn book to the new Blue Baptist hymnal. Now, y'all don't even know what a hymnal is. Oh, there may be some in the rack right there. That's what it looks like. So this isn't a new thing. It's kind of been ongoing. And, and you see, technology has just accelerated it a little bit, added some more preferences. I, I remember in one of the churches I pastored when, when we had the conflict about whether, Dr. Sharp, we could hang some little thin microphones in the choir loft. Because somebody thought, well, we can't have anything hanging in front of the stained glass window. Because that stained glass window has a little plaque on it back there that says who gave that. So we had this sound technician come. We we're going to do a new sound system, including some little microphones. And I said to him, we had a drop-down screen that dropped out of the ceiling right down over in the choir loft. I said, I'd like for you to drop that screen. And on the end, each end of the screen, I'd like you just to hang them little microphone wires. Just hang them there. Don't say anything to anybody. Just hang them there. And let's see how many people notice they're there. At the next business meeting, we had this huge discussion and debate about whether we could hang such as that in the choir loft. And they'd been hanging there for several weeks. Unconnected, disconnected, just hanging there. 
So you see, you don't have to make this stuff up. But I remember during my long tenured pastorate, I determined that we were going to wake up the worship service. You ever need to, did you ever just say, we need to wake this thing up? I wasn't trying to be conflicting or divisive. I wasn't trying to start a war. I just said, Dr. Sharp, we got to wake this worship up. I'm getting tired of standing up to preach and just feeling like I'm at a funeral. We got to wake this up. And so I, I knew that one place we needed to wake it up was in the arena of music. So I very carefully determined and strategized not to make any drastic or immediate changes. By the way, that's a good principle to have. Don't make any quick and drastic changes about anything, but especially when it involves worship, and especially, especially, especially when it involves music. So I said, well, let's just start singing a few new praise choruses that are not in the hymn. Well, that's the way we'll start. That in itself caused a major conflict. Because back then, to a Baptist, if it wasn't in the hymnal, it, you couldn't sing it. It had to get in the hymnal before you could sing it. Once it got in the hymnal, it could have started out as a praise course 15 years earlier. But if it got in the next version of the hymnal, it was okay. But we got through that. And then we attempted to slowly infuse some musical instruments into the worship venue in addition to the piano and the organ. After all, keyboards are not mentioned in the Bible, but stringed instruments, a.k.a. guitars, trumpets and other horns, and even cymbals and drums are instruments of biblical worship. Now, I must confess at this point, I was a bit devious at this point. i just tell you, I was a bit devious. I did not tell the congregation at first that our chairman of deacons had dusted off his bass guitar, which he had played in his college band, and he was getting ready. I didn't tell him that another one of our deacons had offered his drum set that he had played in a rock and roll band before he became a Christian. Now he was a Christian. Now he was one of our deacons, and he was an excellent drummer. And so I said to him, Craig, would you... Get your drum set, clean it up now, make sure it's nice and new looking, and, and set it up way in the back corner of the choir loft. Just set it up. Don't do anything with it. Don't get near it. Don't Certainly don't go play it. Just set it up over there. And so we left it sitting there for a month. And there were a few people. I see, I wanted to see, is anybody going to think that we're desecrating the sanctuary by bringing the drum set in? I wanted to get past that first. And so we, we kind of moved slowly but deliberately from singing a few praise songs to adding some instruments to the piano and the organ in order to wake up the music. That's all I was trying to do was wake up the worship. And I'll always remember the polite but firm conversation with one of our committed and dedicated members. One of many, I'll call them blessed conversations I had over this issue. She sat in my office lamenting and languishing that she wasn't sure if she could stay in our church any longer. She'd been a long tenured member of that church. In fact, she was a charter member of that church. And I said, why in the world can't you stay here? Here's where her words. She said, because we're coming more, becoming more Pentecostal and less Baptist. Her exact words. When I asked her to give an example of her dissatisfaction, she said, oh, you know, all that music we're singing is not Baptist music. Everybody knows that worship in a Baptist church can only be accompanied by piano and organ. Well, I resisted from telling her what I just told you, that you can't find that in the Bible. But I do remember my response. I said to her, I'll be more than apologetic. In fact, I'll commit myself to church discipline. If anyone, if you or anyone else, can show me where, 
We have violated the Bible or the Baptist faith and message. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I've thought of that conversation and many others like it over this issue and many others many times. I've thought of that when I've been tempted don't say you haven't been tempted. I've been tempted to raise my traditional preferences to the same level of doctrinal integrity and thus been in danger of hypocrisy. And by the way, preference often sneaks its way into many arenas other than worship. But let's move to the second H word, the danger of heresy. And though the word heresy or heretic is not used by Jesus in this text, it is very strongly implied. Heresy is an opinion or doctrine not in line with the orthodox or accepted doctrine or the formal denial or doubt of core doctrine of the Christian faith. Thus, a heretic... A, is a professed believer who maintains religious opinions contrary to those accepted by his or her church. So listen carefully to Jesus' warning in verse 9 again. He said, You completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. Other translations Use the word there to observe, to keep, or to uphold. You completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain, observe, keep, or uphold your tradition. Sounds like heresy or even borderline heresy to me, don't you think? And then Jesus gave an example. Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks of father and mother must be evil of father and mother must be put to death. But you say... If a man tells his father or mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me is Corban, that is, a gift committed to the temple, you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. And then Jesus said, you revoke God's Word by your tradition that you have handed down. Jesus not only exposed their hypocrisy, but He indicted them for breaking the fifth commandment to honor father and mother instead of using their wealth to support and provide for their parents. The Pharisees dedicated their wealth as Corban, that is a gift or offering belonging to God, and therefore in their minds it released them from the obligation to support their parents. And Jesus' rebuke is very clear. You revolt. You nullify God's Word by your traditions handed down. That's pretty serious to me. That's pretty plain to me too, is it not to you? Now if you further unpack heresy in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul always used it to expose divisiveness within the church. In Titus 3 verse 10, Paul's counsel is this. Reject a divisive person, a hereticon, a divisive person. A hereticon. After first and second warning, rebuke them, he said. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, a division erupted in the church over the observance of the Lord's Supper. So that Paul concluded in verse 19, there must be factions, heteresis among you, or else you wouldn't be having this conflict, he said. You're having this conflict over the Lord's Supper because there is heteresis, there's faction, division among you. Paul included heteresis or factions in his list of works of the flesh in Galatians 5.20. One commentary I read concluded this, Divisions within the church result in believers who are confused, frustrated, angry, and hurt. And so as with the danger of hypocrisy, doctrinal integrity demands that we guard and avoid heresy as well, lest we create a fellowship of believers who are confused, frustrated, angry, and hurt. As ministers of the gospel and shepherd leaders in the church, we are charged to guard the church against opinions or doctrines not in line with the teaching of Scripture and our confessions of faith. 
We stand on the shoulders of our predecessors, standing and fighting against all of the isms of past generations that would invade, divide, and disrupt the fellowship of the church. Aestheticism, agnosticism, deism, dualism, egalitarianism, egoism, existentialism, Gnosticism, hedonism, humanism, intellectualism, legalism, materialism, naturalism, pantheism, pessimism, racism, skepticism, socialism, universalism. If you Google isms, you'll be brought to the website, the frontistory, and a list of 234 isms. And although all of these are dangerous isms, I want to illustrate with two isms that aren't on the list, which are just as dangerous. Article 10 of the Baptist Faith and Message, entitled Last Things, is one of the shorter articles of faith of the Baptist Faith and Message. It simply reads, it's, it's a quick read, God, in His own time and His own way, will bring the world to its appropriate end. According to His promise, Jesus Christ will return personally and visibly in glory to the earth. The dead will be raised and Christ will be judged. Christ will judge all men in righteousness. The unrighteous will be consigned to hell, the place of everlasting punishment. The righteous in their resurrected and glorified bodies will receive their reward and will dwell forever in heaven with the Lord. Now, you notice in that article there is no mention of an ism. But I can tell you that divisions and factions have occurred and will continue to occur if you infuse millennialism into the conversation. And you can't just talk about millennialism. By the way, that's in the book of Revelation if you want to go pick that out. Not the ism, but the word millennial. You can't just talk about millennialism because the factions of Post-millennialism, amillennialism, premillennialism exist. And you've got to divide premillennialism into dispensational premillennialism and historical premillennialism. And there's some who've even said, well, I'm just a pan-millennialist. I think it was all pan out one day. 